Hello, my name is Eric Kazarian. I'm an otolaryngologist, head and neck surgeon, also known as an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and one of the relatively few surgeons in the world that specializes in the surgical treatment of snoring and obstructive sleep apnea. I love my work because snoring and sleep apnea are common, fascinating, and challenging problems that can affect health, social relationships, and the ability to get a simple good night's sleep and get the most out of life. Most people, including most surgeons, other types of physicians, and dentists, have an overly simplified view about surgery for snoring or sleep apnea, thinking that one treatment is appropriate for everyone or that surgery does not work. Both of these are just not true. I hope to explain my approach to making informed treatment decisions with my patients to find out what might work best for them. I am committed to providing state-of-the-art patient care and advancing the field through research and training of other surgeons in this country and around the world. This video is the first in a series. In it, I explain my approach to snoring and obstructive sleep apnea and a question that is often overlooked, why we treat snoring and sleep apnea in the first place. Later videos will explore the full range of treatment options. My website has additional information about snoring and sleep apnea. I hope you enjoy the videos and the website. Most people have been kept awake at night by the sound of someone else's snoring. Snoring is just that, a sound caused by vibration of structures inside the throat, typically the soft palate and uvula, at the back of the roof of your mouth. Obstructive sleep apnea is a more serious condition that often involves snoring, but also includes blockage of breathing that can cause health problems and can prevent you from getting deep, restful sleep, leaving you tired and unable to function well during the day. Because many patients with loud snoring also have obstructive sleep apnea, and because the treatments for snoring can be different than for sleep apnea, evaluation of someone with loud disruptive snoring usually includes a sleep study that can distinguish between the two. Sleep studies can be performed in a bed of a sleep laboratory or in your own bed at home. Home sleep studies generally monitor breathing patterns, oxygen levels, and heart rhythms, while the studies in the sleep laboratory are more detailed adding monitors of brain waves and eye movements to determine the kinds of sleep someone is getting and also to check for some other sleep disorders. A sleep study will determine whether someone has snoring alone or obstructive sleep apnea, which is important in making treatment decisions and because health insurance generally covers treatment for obstructive sleep apnea but not for snoring without sleep apnea. We all laugh about snoring. But snoring and the choking or gasping for air that can occur with sleep apnea can be a major problem for others, preventing them from getting sleep and driving them, or the person that snores, out of the bedroom. People come to see me all the time because of loud snoring. And the good news is that treatment can help eliminate snoring. In snoring without sleep apnea, reducing snoring is the major goal of treatment. There are some studies suggesting that snoring itself may carry some risks to your health, but these risks are probably low. When snoring occurs with obstructive sleep apnea, I still care about the snoring that affects others, but I also care about possible effects on health and the quality of sleep for the person with sleep apnea. Let's talk about those. The health effects of sleep apnea are most clear for cardiovascular effects, such as an increased risk of developing high blood pressure or more serious events like a heart attack, stroke, or even early death. There also may be risks of diabetes or a related problem called insulin resistance, and there is some evidence of a greater chance of developing cancer. It is important to recognize these health risks, but you should also know that these risks are much more of a concern for those with what we call moderate to severe sleep apnea, with more frequent blockage of breathing, and for those with other risk factors like obesity, high blood pressure, or diabetes. Basically, if you have mild sleep apnea, and especially if you don't have any of these other risk factors, studies suggest that you do not have to be so worried about health effects of sleep apnea. My sense is that there is quite a bit of hysteria out there about sleep apnea, whether from websites, health or life insurance companies, or even other physicians and dentists, scaring everyone with any level of sleep apnea into thinking they are going to die in their sleep. Treating sleep apnea is important, 
But you have to understand what the research really shows before making bold statements or important decisions that affect other people. When we are in deep, restful sleep, the muscles in our body are especially relaxed. Because the throat is basically a tube surrounded by muscles and soft tissues, in deep sleep, this muscle relaxation allows the muscle and soft tissues to flutter around and cause snoring, or to collapse and block breathing and sleep apnea. When blockage in breathing occurs, the body's natural response is to wake up into lighter sleep, leaving some people with sleep apnea unable to get any of that deep, restful sleep. Not everyone with sleep apnea is affected in this way, but many people wake up in the morning still feeling sleepy or fatigued and unable to function well during the day. We are not sure exactly why, but it is interesting that how tired you are and how poor sleep affects your quality of life is not related to how bad your obstructive sleep apnea is, meaning that some people with mild sleep apnea can be getting terrible sleep and feel very tired, and some with severe sleep apnea may not be tired at all. I tell my patients that I want to improve their snoring, their health, and their quality of sleep so that they can get the most out of life. At the same time, I do not scare them unnecessarily or make false promises. The bottom line is that the reason why we treat snoring or sleep apnea can be different for different patients. Answering this question is critical because I always weigh risks and benefits when making treatment decisions with my patients. I hope you enjoy the other videos in this series that cover how I select treatments and the full range of available treatment options.